God's pattern for building his temple in this generation is not a drawing but a person. The person of Jesus Christ. He is the one in whom God is well pleased. God's pleasure had prospered in his hands. Learning crucial lessons from the pattern of priesthood of Jesus is the burden for the year 2006 clergy retreat, which was on the theme, Behold My Servant. It's held at Bethany Resort, Kilometer 21, Yandev, Boko, Aliede Road, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria, between Monday 16th and Thursday 19th, October 2006. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Living Seed Media, Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone number 44 470 824 0802 6577 392. Email address lsmedia at Or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings us the word of life. Our Father. As you continue to show us Christ and the practical challenges of his own life, the cry of our heart is that we ourselves might be transformed into his very likeness from one degree of glory to another. We thank you for the privilege of having Jesus as the man you are showing to us. Thank you, Father, that you are not just asking that we will be tracing him from outside, but that he will come and live that life within us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. I'd like us to please take our Bibles as we return to our theme text, Isaiah 42. Yesterday we were able to consider verse 1 to a point, and we would like to take Isaiah 42 from verse 1 to 4 again. But we will go to look at verse 2 and verse 3 more deliberately. Isaiah 42, but we'll read from verse 1 all through to verse 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Behold my servant. But along with that we are now going to take one more passage while we are beholding the Lord Jesus. And I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, yesterday, uh, the chairman of the day yesterday uh, read for us from Philippians 2. But this money again we are going to have a need 
to look at it. I want us to read it from verse 5 down to verse 11. Maybe we can read it actually to verse 13. 5 to 13. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who walks in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Behold my servant. Now, as the word of God was coming to us even this morning and our brother was examining the prayer life of the Lord Jesus Christ and the priority that he had placed on prayer as the priority of all priorities and he began to draw issues some of the issues that our brother was referring us to, I realized that they were cardinal issues in the very life of Jesus that we need to examine uh, more deeply and practically as we behold God's servant. Now, let me again establish one proposition on which we are going to study. The first proposition is that it is established all through the word of God that if we see him as he is, then we shall be like him. Is that what the Bible says? It's repeated for us in 2 Corinthians 3 is brought back to us in Colossians even chapter chapter 3 and is repeated again in 1 John chapter 3 talking about seeing him and then you become like him so what we are longing for this morning again as we behold Jesus is not just that we want to admire him. Are you getting me? It's not just that we want to just say, ah, look at how great he is. If that is all about it, it will not do us much good. Because we will have just looked at it and gone away. <clears throat> But we find that each time God unveils his son unto any man, something happens to that man. A transformation takes place in that man's life. And so it's like, as the word of God keeps saying, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, is like that is the way 
by which we will be transformed. Now, I don't know, but I sense that it's a principle that we might not be able to particularly explain so explicitly and say, this is what happens, this is how it happens, this is uh, the, the mathematics of it or whatever. But that's how God had ordained it to be. So, what is touching me this morning is as, behold my servant, we will want to look at him again in order to become like him. Hallelujah. Much more that the book of Philippians began to introduce something to us here. Say, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So it meant that Jesus Christ was not mindless. Jesus Christ was not thoughtless. He had a mind. And there was a mind behind all that he did and all that he became. And I'm confronted this morning with the fact of what is it that God is saying, behold in my servant that will transform my own life and transform us and transform the ministry that God has committed to our hands. Before we return to the book of Isaiah and look at the nitty gritty of some of the issues that were raised there, there were a few things that the word of God said clearly in these chapters that we must draw attention to very quickly. And as our brother uh, just came on some of the verses I intended to study elaborately with you this morning, I just confirmed in my heart that we are in the same direction that the Lord had been speaking to us about. Now, when you turn to that Ephesians, I mean Philippians, there were some two issues that became, it jumped out, it jumped out about Jesus. Now, when verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. It was as if, because let me, let me ask you, have you ever seen anybody's mind? Eh? Okay. So you know what touched me? Was as if the Holy Spirit is saying, there is something behind Jesus that made him who he is. And if you also ever desire, even if it will be in a very little dimension, to walk like he walked, to operate like he operated, to see results, even if it's in a little dimension, like he saw results. Don't just try to copy him externally. Because what made him who he was, was not external. You are not with me. There was something inside. There was something in him that made him who he was. And God is not inviting us just to look at the externalities around Jesus. That will not work. He said, there was a mind that Christ had that made him do all that he did. Let this mind 
do what? Be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the question that immediately came to me is that, oh, so God wants to show me something. I don't know how to describe it. But the way it's come to me is that God wants to say, look, I have been telling you to behold my servant, whom I uphold. I showed you a few things about him yesterday that is so impressive, but yet it is external. Do you understand that now? Now I want to take you a little beyond. Let, let me show you what nobody normally will see. The mind that was in him that made him do all that he did. And that if you can catch that mind that made him who he became in a very short while, that same mind we do what? We produce what will it produce? The same kind of man that my servant is. He will produce it in you. So in my heart this morning, but you know I have a fear. And I've been praying about that since the Lord began to speak to me about this. I say, oh God, how can we attempt this sophisticated study about the mind of Christ in a short moment that we have. So, you must pray with me that God will do the supernatural. I want you to pray with me that in a short moment, the Holy Spirit we take this message from our hands and do the supernatural with it in such a way that when you are rising from here something in you will change because what I sense God is saying is this what you are presently is the result of the mind in you. You are not with me. What you are now, what constitutes your tastes and your anger, what constitutes your aspiration and your discouragement, what constitutes even your personality is not external. It's something that you have carried for years. It's something that you have been building upon for years. And I am saying to God, Somebody had carried a mind for 50 years that made him who he is, that has already set his ways, set his taste, set his direction in life. How can he lose that and acquire another mind in one hour? It has to be supernatural. And I do not even put emphasis on what we can do here. But we must trust God who invited us one by one and said, go to that meeting. When our Lord Bishop was speaking this morning and he felt maybe he would not come. And then he suddenly felt that the Lord was saying, go to that meeting. And if we had given chance 
for several of other people that they didn't plan. But somehow, something just say, go to that meeting. There will have been several stories which we don't have time for. So it looks to me as if your being here is not an accident. Something is about to happen. Something is about to take place in your life, in your ministry, and in the denominations over the which God has made you overseers. But that is our own limitation and weakness about this that we are attempting to do what human beings cannot do. So God must help us. And I want to say that God will help us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, so the, the, the issue with me now is this. What was the secret behind it will be a bad word if I say what is the secret behind the masquerade do you see that now I will be going to speak my old language so I am afraid of doing that but it's like God is saying oh you see that Jesus did this you see that Jesus spoke like this. You see that Jesus prayed like this. You see that Jesus went like this. You see that Jesus did this. And you are all excited. And you love him. And you want to be like him. But there is something in him. That is doing what? That is producing that. Unless you get it. You can only admire in vain. You can only say, hey, oh, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. But you will have no capacity to be like him. Because what makes him? Where is it? It's inside. So let's see what made Jesus. And if God can help us to say, hey, so I need this, then we can pray together. Now, I'm going to ask us to be reading from different versions in order to make the study a bit simple for us as the Lord will guide us. Now, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God. And when the King James used the word, who being in the form of God. Look at how good news expressed that. Good news in verse 6 says, He always had the very nature of God. Please look at this. When the word of God in King James said, who is in the being in the form of God, you may have an impression that he is just a form. But the truth is that he is not just a form. Are you understand? He is in very nature God. How did NIV put that verse 6 quickly? In the very nature. Read, read it for me from NIV. Uh -uh, you have added off there. Reread it. You will notice that there is no off in the new international version. Yes, sir. In very nature, God. God. What is Jesus? God. In very nature, 
He is God. In every essence, all that made God God is where? Is Jesus. Everything that you will find in God that will make you say, Oh my God, Jesus Himself, in very nature, in every essence, He is God. He is God. In every sense, in capacity. In wisdom, in insight, let me inform you, please, even in age. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to talk about. God had not existed for 10 years when he decided to give back to Jesus. No. He said, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. When you read the Bible more and more, it will baffle you that even God the Father, God the Father, in Hebrews chapter 1, do you know how he addressed Jesus? How did he address Jesus? He said, Thy throne, O God. You, you, you couldn't understand what I'm saying. If it is possible for us to arrange the Godhead, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son, if they were to sit here, When God the Father will stand up to address the Son, He will not just say, My Son. He will say, Thy throne, O God. And when God the Son will stand up to address God the Father, He will say, O God. My Lord. And the Holy Ghost is also not in any little sense lower. You see, this is too complex for human mind. That's why the doctrine of Trinity is a baffles human mind. It even baffles ourselves that I've been preaching it for years. Because you can't, you can't just imagine what we are talking about. Now, I want you to get something because it is something that we are looking at. And if it is on the surface, it will have been easy. But as a man's mind is never on the surface, you need to search it. So we are having to dig and search and search and search if we can touch the mind that Jesus Christ had that made him who he was and who he is. And we are not studying that simply for theological exercise. We are studying it so that we also may acquire that mind. Do you understand now? We are pressing into this because he says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. That's why we are here. Now, what was this mind is the issue we are trying to press. And they said, Who, being in very nature, God, 
did not consider equality with God something to be what? To be grasped. Huh? It's a problem here. Let me first ask a question. Where do you consider? Where do you consider? Whenever they say consider, consider a matter. Eh? You only consider a matter in your mind. King James didn't use the word consider. He used the word he did not think. And where do we think? In the mind, we think inside our mind. He did not think that by force he should grasp equality with God. Please get something that God only can help us to get. So you see Jesus. Everything that God the Father is. Is what he. In himself is. Are you with me? All the privileges. If anybody. Should be carrying. Amplified Bible. You have amplified Bible. Where is Amplified Bible today? No Amplified Bible today? There is one at the back there. Stand up and read for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who, although being essentially one with God. Essentially is one with God. And in the form of God. Yes. Possessing the fullness of the attributes. He possesses the fullness of the attributes. Which make God. God. Which made God. God. Yes. Are you getting that now? Essentially. He possesses the attributes. Which made God. God. Yes. Did not think this equality with God. Uh -huh. Was a thing to be eagerly grasped. He uh -huh. did not think that this equality with God is something to be eagerly grasped yes, or retained. Or retained. Hi. And God is saying, Behold my servant. Behold someone that I can work with. Look at the issue here. He was not submitting to God because God was higher. Oh my God. Am I confusing you? It was not superiority that subdues him. It was not lack that subdues him. It was not an incapacitation that made him submissive. But there was something in his mind. Something that took place in his heart. That made him to conclude that 
even this equality with God is not something to do what? To grasp. To hold tightly to. And to struggle to retain it. Friends, is it like that with you? I'm asking a question. Is it like that with us? Did you see that what is the quiet struggle in our lives is simply because we think in our mind that what we are I am just assuming that it is what we are that we are thinking it is something to do what? to grasp to hold tight letter and to fight anybody who wants to remove it. Do you see that? As soon as you are made a DCC chairman, or a conference secretary or a district superintendent or an archdeacon do you know what has started happening in your mind You regard it as something to do what? To grasp. And if anybody tries not to remove it, but just to tamper with it or shake it, or do something as if you are not the archdeacon, do you notice that something inside of your mind jumped and said, what does he mean? So do you notice that unconsciously many of us our ministry is not about serving. It's about grasping position. Unconsciously, it's about making sure that this thing that I now have, please listen, you did not steal it. I want to submit to you that it's not that you stole it. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? We are not talking of those. Who are claiming to be what they are not. I'm talking about what you are now. You know, please forget about those who are claiming to be something. That's not the issue now. We are talking of Jesus. Who in the very nature is God. God himself acknowledges and says, your throne, O oh God. God himself declared, he said, all that were made, were made by you. And without you, there was nothing that was made that was made. And he did not think that this equality with God, as glorious as it is, is something 
To be what? To be held tenaciously as not to lose it. He didn't think that it was something to be grasped. Brothers, sisters, when God said, Behold my servant, and said, God, what, what again do you want me to see about your servant? He said, Let me show you his mind. Your problem is your mind. Behind every effort to cover something. Are you hearing me? Every desire to cover something so that what you are holding, nobody will take it from you, is because in your mind you thought this thing must be what? Grasped. Now I'm saying, why, how does that affect our ministry? And I'm hearing God say, very much, in every way, many of my servants, they are no more there to serve me. But what are they there for? To grasp to maintain, to retain, to fight tooth and nail and to do everything that lies within their power and their office to perpetuate what they presently hold. This is the reason why even though you have no message to preach, you cannot come down and say, excuse me, God is not speaking with me today. If it is this young man that has a message for the church of God to continue, let him preach. As soon as that young man is preaching and you are watching the faces of the people and you see how they are getting excited and they are feeling good, something is telling you that this young man is going to take away your position. Grasp it. So you will see something will rise inside of you. You will just be waiting for that young man to finish. So once it comes out, you will find yourself, even when you are not on, on, on program, you will come out. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I just thank God for this boy. Uh, these are some of my boys that I've raised and they are just coming up. Now, why did you have to emphasize that this man of God is a boy? There is something that you want to grasp. There is a quiet threat in your mind. There is something that is speaking every time. You must ensure that this thing does not fall out of your hand. It's better to die holding it in your hand. So for this reason, you will not understand why God's work cannot be done. To you, it might look ordinary. But God is saying, Behold my servant. He said, He will not cry out. And you will not hear his voice on the street. 
He has no matter to defend. He has nothing to agitate about. When he said, you will not hear his voice on the street. Oh, it touched me. Do you know what touched me? He healed somebody somewhere in the Gospels. And he, he called the man. He said, please, you have been healed. He said, yes. Please, please, I beg you, don't tell anybody about this. Don't tell them. Don't tell them I'm the one. Please, go. And the cross reference to that passage was referring back to Isaiah 42. I say, ah, ah. Excuse me, sir. Could any archdeaconry organize a program in your diocese and put the picture of the archdeacon and did not first flash the picture of his grace, the archbishop, and then his lordship, my lord bishop, and he will go score free. I'm sorry for offending you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you want me, I will prostrate for you. But I must tell you now. Why does that offend you? There is something in your mind that is seeking something to do what? To grasp. And no matter how much money it costs to print that, that program, to make a color separation, you don't mind You have condemned a program booklet that was printed. 2,000 was printed and you brought it and say, what, what nonsense is it? What nonsense is this? Get out from my sight. You don't understand canonical. <laughs> and, and, let me ask you, how much money is being spent on servicing positions. Behold my servant. Now I have not asked a question of who are you. I have not asked the question of what essentially are we. What are we essentially? The Bible says he in every sense and in every essence and in very nature he is God. And he, he did not think that equality with God is something to be grasped. Excuse me. Who are you? And what are you that you have con 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 continuously thought and worked and labored to grasp it? I don't think God is pointing us to Jesus. If not because he wants to he wants us to experience something different in our ministry. As I'm confronted, you know there are some preaching that you have to preach just because you are, have to preach. If you give me a chance, I will not be preaching. 
I would have just kneeled down and I would have been crying and say, hey, hey. so what is it? What, who am I that I'm grasping something? And you may not know that you grasp something. But can I give you a little litmus test of a sense of grasping? Your sense of loss. Do you know that ordinary greeting? Ordinary greeting, just greeting, could mean so much that for a long time you are saying, but he didn't greet me. What an arrogance. didn't greet me. Now, if he greets you, what does that mean? If he doesn't greet you, how does that reduce you? But why do you make a big deal out of that? Because in your mind, there is something to grasp. And you are saying, as they are not greeting you now. That's how gradually. <laughs> you will pass to oblivion. May the Lord, you know, I'm, we are saying this among ourselves. We are not talking out. If you are the one who carried it out, it's your business. But we are here among ourselves. The Holy Ghost. Is raising a very serious question. Now, as we are reading, the Bible said, now let's read. We have got to that verse 6, isn't it? He did not count this equality with God a thing to be grasped. I'm now reading it from Revised Standard Version. And Revised Standard say, verse 7, But emptied himself. What did he do? He emptied himself. Now, excuse me. Looking at Jesus is very humbling. It's very, very humbling. Sincerely speaking, if 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 you permit me, we will just stop and call on him again and say, Why are we so different from you? Now let me tell you something. If what Jesus carried was rubbish, rubbish, what is the big deal of emptying your can, your container of rubbish? Eh? Is there anything big that when you know that what you carry is rubbish and you see something that is precious and you don't have another container, what do you do? You empty it because it was rubbish. 
But let me inform you. What Jesus emptied. What he emptied. Is. Equality. With God. The supreme advantage of being God. That is what he did what? He emptied. To become a servant. But I want to ask when Jesus confronts people and said, Any of you that wants to be a disciple of mine, let him deny himself, let him empty himself. Now, in my mind, do you think that uh, let him empty himself is equal with the emptying of self that Jesus did? God is asking you to throw away. I must ask you a question. Of what use was actually yourself? Mr. Self, what use was it? Self that made you beat your wife. Self that pushed us into serious disgrace. Self that made us struggle for useless non entities. And Jesus said, Empty that so that I can give you something precious. And we are not eager to do that. And I see people beating their chest. Me? Me? And I say, and you know it was Dr. Yamsat two years ago that came and confused death with all of us here by the Holy Ghost. He said, who are you? Do you remember that message? Say, who are you? In fact, he didn't even say who are you. He said, what are you? Where are you coming from? And all of us, we suddenly began to find our level. Say, actually, who am I? What was it that made us anything different? Is it not the grace of God? And yet, we grasp with our two hands what did not belong to us in the first place. And with that, we have no space for anything greater that God wanted to release onto the earth through our lives. He emptied himself. And if you like me to say it the way I want to say, he emptied his good, precious self. If I were to empty myself now, what will I empty? What will I empty? My terrible, useless, confused, wicked, and helpless self. I put away ashes so that it can put beauty in me. Behold my servant. What I was going to ask is, if you leave PhD, I 